And John and Joseph, thank, thank you for having me. Well, before you get started, Sherry, I, I want to I want to take the pleasure to introduce you because I'm super excited to be able to share your not just your wisdom, your heartfelt wisdom on helping people be better, smarter, faster at what I think is critical to life, relationships and results. And um, and we first met when we connected in Boston at the Women's Sales Pro Conference that we were lucky enough to participate in and and, uh, and to sponsor. And it's an organization that has, uh, is it 50 or 70 of the top women sales and marketing professionals in the world? Sherry, how, how large is your organization? You know, it's growing all the time. Uh, I don't know the exact exact number, but you're right, John, it's between about 50 and 50, 70, and it's all women sales leaders. It's run by Lori Richardson, founded by Jill Conrath. And so if you are a women woman sales pro, I, I, I encourage you to Google that and look that up. We'll put a link to the organization in the chat box uh, for everybody to access. But when we first met, um, there was instant connection. And I think that uh, it was on our commonality of, of really the power of relationships and the power of connecting and the importance of doing that, even in a business situation, because I think that if you lead with empathy, if you lead with the desire to help other people grow, that you can't help but grow. And then after I heard you speak, I was sold. And so uh, for those that don't know Sherry, she helps sales teams bridge the gap between beating quota and selling with a authentic heartfelt approach she founded the sherry levinson group and she's helped create over a billion dollars in increased revenue in over 40 countries and she's the best-selling author of a number of amazing books including the one you see here heart and sell 10 universal truths every salesperson needs to know and she's a regular contributor to places like forbes and ceo magazine and, and huffington post and if you're looking for a speaker if you're looking for a trainer who can really change the way you think and and sell and connect with others you need to connect with sherry and sherry that's why we are excited to have you here so rock and roll us well thank you for that lovely introduction john and i've got to tell you when i met john in boston for the first time i felt like i was meeting a movie star and this was before i knew you bought jack nicholson's house john which you just told me <laughs> but um you know, we've been using Nimble for years. And when I connected with my team and told them, oh my gosh, the CEO of Nimble is here. I had to send pictures. Everybody was giddy. So the feeling is mutual, John. And uh, I'm delighted uh, to share really wisdom that I've learned from all of you, from the salespeople, the sales leaders, the business leaders out in the field. I feel like um, you know, training is a muscle. We must continually work it out to stay in shape. And um, we're always learning. So I just want to thank you. Every time I do a webinar or a speech, uh, I learn a ton. And I've already learned quite a bit from you, John. So um, ready to rock and roll and, and to get started. And uh, what I want to talk about today at the very beginning is what's changed? Now, we didn't ask how long you all have been in sales or in business for yourself, but I can tell you after being in sales for the last 20, 25 years, a lot has changed and particularly information. And uh, this is me when I started in sales, I was 22 years old and I literally had to get up every single morning at 6.30 and drive to a sales meeting. Because back then, you had to literally drive or go to where the knowledge was. I remember I'd have to pay a lot of money to buy Tom Hopkins audio tapes. Um, John, I don't, don't know what, what you did back in the day to learn and keep yourself educated. Um, but it either cost money, you had to go far, or you had to spend a lot of time. And of course, the big change is, from where do we get our information today? And uh, John, what, what do you have to say about that? Where do we get our information? 
Well, in the old days, we used to go to a, a library or a bookstore and we bought a book. In fact, I bought Tom Hopkins' book on selling, and it was right there next to no Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I think that that great people are built on the shoulders of other great people, and I think that a lot of the knowledge that uh, that we've accumulated on how to be better, smarter, faster at sales and marketing and relationships has really been an um, amalgamation of, of all of these great concepts. But I think that today it's changed and it, uh, a lot. Yeah, and, and really what's so interesting about that change is today we don't have to go anywhere to get information. We don't even have to spend money to get information. Look, you do these fabulous webinars. In fact, information comes to us. You know, everybody's got it right now in their back pocket. We, in fact, we have so much information that if you're like most people, you're suffering from a little bit of information overload. In fact, one of the things I always say is accessing information isn't a challenge today. It's filtering it. And it's the same for our customers. Our, our customers are bombarded. Um, the, all the stats show, depending on the industry you're in, customers are... 67 to 85% through the buyer's journey before they even talk to us. So our customers are overwhelmed with information. And now um, put that next to the fact that trust is at an all-time low. So we have overwhelm at an all-time high, trust at an all-time low. And what that means is that we really have to think about how do we get through to our customer today? And unfortunately, John, I find a lot of salespeople are overcompensating and they're either too empathetic because they know that trust is so low, so they're really nice and they're building a relationship. Or on the other hand, they've got too much courage. They get right to the point right away. And a customer that has low trust, this just doesn't work today. I always say products are so complex today. People don't have to understand a product in order to buy a product, but they do have to know you understand them and that you're a trusted resource. So the question- you know, Sherry, Sherry, that, that, that is such a key point. I love it when you say that, and I wanna make sure that everybody got that. So can you repeat it? I said, people today don't have to understand mm -hmm. a product in order to buy a product, but they do need to know that you understand them and that you are a trusted resource. Look, and, products and I are think, so I mean, I don't even know how my yeah. microwave works, let alone software, right? Yes, and, and this is the foundation, I think, of everything else that you're going to say. And I just want to make a point. Please, if you have questions throughout the presentation, ask them in the Q&A section in the questions area. We'll answer them in the background as well as bring them up at the end and answer them to everybody. Sherry, go ahead. Awesome. So, so what we're going to talk about today is how do you balance? How do we all balance the customer's need, our need for this heartfelt, empathetic connection with our other need to roll up our sleeves, sell and pay the bills. And it can be a challenge. And I find it's one of the greatest challenges for sales managers, for salespeople, regardless of your industry. Um, it's tough. How do you create this incredible rapport and then at the same time create urgency to buy as soon as possible? How do we shorten that sales cycle with a customer who is overwhelmed and uh, quite frankly has has very low trust. So what I'm going to talk about today are, um, oh, this is my my balance slide. I, I love this. So, um, uh, you know, how, how do we create that balance? I just thought that was a lovely image. Uh, so what we're going to share today are four critical pieces of any sales presentation. And within each of those, how are we balancing this sort of empathy and courage, if you will, or empathy and competency? And I'm going to answer the question that I asked you or that Joseph asked you at the very beginning, what's more important? And I will tell you, it's a little bit of a trick question. So we're going to talk about connecting with our customers, asking, listening, and linking. And I love the acronym. It's CALL, because I do believe today we We've got to pick up the phone and quit relying on email. And uh, with social media, we're, we've gotten uh, very lazy, all of us, me included. So let's talk about connecting. And I asked you all a question in the very beginning, which trait is more important? And 
I will say it was a trick question. The truth of the matter is they're both important. And there was a great article in the Harvard Business Review last spring that talked about these are the two traits that are most critical to influence. And what is sales but influence? So competency and empathy account for 90% of your ability to influence your customers to make a sale. Now think about that. I think that in and of itself is fascinating. Empathy and competency. Now, they are both equally important. But here's what Harvard Business Review says. The order matters. So while competency, particularly today, knowing your product, knowing your customer, knowing the competition is super important, it's empathy that gets you in the door. And it's competency, reliability, integrity, and authenticity that keep you there. Those are the five cornerstones of trust. And I'm going to say them again. John, I'm going to say them one more time. Empathy gets you in the door. Reliability, competency, integrity, and authenticity keep you there. And the reason I say that, you've probably had the experience where you're at a party or you're at a business event and somebody leads with competency. The truth is, it's a little bit of a put off. Um, how many times have you had somebody connect with you on LinkedIn, John, and the moment that you connect, they say, hey, John, let me tell you about my state of the art, blah, blah, blah solution. And what do you think? Whoa, hey, we don't even have a relationship. So there's a human tendency to say, hey, look how good I am. Look how smart I am. I tell my 13 year old son all the time, you're being factually correct when you lead with competency, but emotionally incorrect. People don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. So the order matters. And John, I'd just love to get your experience on empathy versus competency. Well, you know, I, I love the fact that the best-selling book by Satya Nadella, the book Hit Refresh, where it talks about his quest to rediscover Microsoft's soul and imagine a better future for everyone, it leads with empathy. Because I really believe that if you lead with competency, you're going to sound boisterous and you're not really going to understand the person that you're connecting to. But if you create a better understanding by asking simple questions and listening, they'll tell you everything you need to know. And then you could use your competency to address their concerns more, more directly. So you and I are reading out of the same hymn book for sure. And I love this graph, and it just shows that, again, if we start with competency, people actually fear us. They distrust us. This is in all relationships, by the way, uh, in a work relationship, in a social situation. If we start telling people how great we are, um, I love my speaking coach, Eric Chester, always says, what's the first thing that people do when they meet? They say, what do you do? You know, we sort of have our speech and we try to inflate what we do a little bit, or we simply say what's on our business cards. and to try to remember we're not human doings, we're human beings. And the best thing we can do is find out what's important to the other person first. And so we have to lead with that empathy. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, my husband, uh, several years ago, probably a couple of years ago, John, he was in the market for a new vehicle. And God knows we needed a new vehicle. We lovingly called his vehicle a shopping cart. It was a 10 year old Prius. And uh, it sort of rattled as we drove up the hill. So, you know, he says, all right, I'll, I'll call down in Salt Lake and, you know, find out about buying a new truck. So he called the salesperson and said, you know, we'll be down there in about 40 minutes. And the whole way down in the car, he must have said to me five times, I'm not buying anything today. Just so you know, I, I'm really analytical. I know you're more emotional, but we are absolutely not buying a truck. I said, okay, honey, that's fine. That's fine. We don't have to buy anything today. So we get to Salt Lake. And out comes a middle-aged guy, Canadian accent, his name's Jared. And he looks at my husband and he says, thank you so much for coming in, Lee. You know, I always like to look up the people I serve. So I looked up a little bit about you on LinkedIn. He says, turns out you're the past president of the National Ability Center. He says, my son has autism. So it's a center that helps children that are autistic or in need. He said, thank you so much for the work you do. Well, my husband's eyes just lit up. And before you know it, they were in Jared's office, probably 30, 35 minutes talking about the National Ability Center, treatment programs, how wonderful it is for the families. And they were just 
like best friends and we start walking out to the car lot. We hadn't even seen a truck. My husband looks over at me and he says, I think he's going to have the vehicle we need. He hadn't even seen a truck and he bought it. And I say this because Jared was smart enough to A, connect by doing his homework, which is critical, but B, he connected with my husband authentically on values, not on competency. He started with that empathy. And of course, uh, we ended up, that's me and Jared. Uh, my husband would not be in the picture, but we left with this beautiful new Ram truck on that very day. So here's what I just want to end this little section with. When we talk about connecting with a customer, I'd just like you to remember, here's the take homes for today. Always lead with empathy in any of your communication. If you're at a networking event, if you're social selling, um, if you meet with a client for the first time, the second time, just yesterday, I was with uh, a wonderful potential new client. And I remember one of the gentlemen said to me, uh, can you go through your proposal? And what a nice man. Instead, I thought, you know, I need to ask him what he thinks of the proposal and what his concerns are. And this nice gentleman spoke for an entire hour. And that's how we connected is by listening, by me listening. So again, if you're working with a client or potentially working with a client, you wanna listen first. Um, I always say, give them what the internet can't. This is huge today. So we've started with empathy, but then we wanna show the competency. And you want to do all the research you can on their industry and offer them some insights that they might not normally have had. We've gotta work harder today. The customer knows more. So we have to offer them something that they can't read about or find out about on the internet. So you've gotta do your homework. Um, the other thing I say is you've got to love the unlovable. I think that speaks for itself. You're not going to love everybody you meet right away, but if you look hard enough, you'll always find something to love about everybody. And of course, make them feel important. So that's number one, John, is when we're balancing this heart and cell, we always want to lead with empathy. Now, the next section I want to talk about is ask. And I will tell you, probably the biggest mistake I say salespeople or business development people make is we don't listen, we don't ask questions before we launch into a presentation. And when we do, we often don't ask the right questions. And yet questions are the most important part of any sales process. John, do you remember, I think this was about oh gosh, maybe seven, eight years ago, there was an article in the New York Times about questions helping you fall in love. You know, you Sherry, know. I, I, I didn't remember that, but when you shared that with me in our practice run earlier this week, I, I loved it. In fact, I'm going to share it with uh, everybody who's listening uh, now, 36 questions for somebody to fall in love with you. And here's what's so cool about it. So this kind of went viral years ago before things were really going viral. And the idea was, is that an author created 36 questions, which moved in intensity. So they started off being, you know, pretty easy questions to answer and they got progressively more intimate. And the idea was, if you sat down with anyone, it could be your spouse, could be somebody you just met, it could be a coworker, and you asked and answered and listened to all 36 questions, you would fall in love with them. And I'll tell you, I did try it with my husband. I didn't try it with the neighbor down the street, admittedly, um, but we had a wonderful weekend. We felt closer, we felt more connected. And I think we can take that idea in sales. If 36 questions can help two people fall in love, can 36 or call it 10, 15 well crafted questions show your competency and your empathy and the answer is absolutely yes and i love this quote from the unbearable lightness of being and that is the stupidity of people comes from having an answer for everything the wisdom of the novel comes from having a question for everything so then the question becomes all right sherry well i've heard of open-ended questions and closed-ended questions and these questions and i think this can be very confusing for salespeople. So years ago, we put together the three types of questions that you need to ask in any sales encounter. And let me tell you, they work. 
and I call it the anatomy of a sales question. And these are skin, bone, and heart questions. So let's talk about what they are. Skin questions are, well, they're surfacy, and we've got to ask them. But skin questions are questions like, uh, what provider are you currently using? Um, skin questions are, um, they're the facts. They're the basic, easy questions to ask. Uh, what percentage of market share do you have? Who else might be in the decision-making process? Who are the stakeholders? So again, super important questions, but that's where 80% of your competition stops. The best salespeople move past the skin question and break through to the bones. Now, what bone questions do is they elaborate on skin questions. And research has shown that when customers start, at, start answering bone questions, they become engaged, they know you care more, they certainly know you're more competent, because they're talking, they're thinking. I always say people don't believe it when they say, when we say it, they believe it when they say it. So again, we're getting the customer to talk, we're getting them to engage. And bone questions also reveal problems. We all say no problem, no sale. Well, great salespeople not only uncover problems, but the implications or financial or emotional impact of those problems. So again, I advise salespeople, write down all your questions. Before you go into any sales encounter, everybody should have a needs analysis pre-written out. Bone questions are questions like, and you may wanna write these down, um, what's the financial impact of such and such a problem? How long has that been a challenge for you? If you could change anything about your current situation, what would it be? Very, very important. But the most critical questions are questions of the heart. The best salespeople in the world, like I said, they break through the skin, go to the bones, and get to the heart of a customer's decision-making process because it's in the heart where decisions are made. And we all know that. We all know that decisions are emotional. But I can tell you, John, very few salespeople ask those emotional questions. So if questions are made emotionally and in the heart, why aren't we asking the questions that reveal those heart motivators? And I don't care if you're B2C or B2B, human beings run companies. Human beings are emotional in their decision-making process. So a heart question might be, how will such and such a solution affect you personally? Who else is impacted? Who else is impacted? And I love this question. We talked about this before, John. I got this out of the book, Just Listen, by Goulston. And that is, what one thing that you know is impossible, if you could change it, would most impact your business or your life if you're B2C? What one thing would make the biggest difference in your life or your business? But you know it's impossible, but if it was possible, what one thing would that be? Sherry, I love these questions. I, they, they make me pause and dig deep in order to respond to you. And by you asking me questions like that, it shows you care. And I, I really believe that that goes back to that whole leading with empathy thing, because you're not even talking about competency yet. You're just getting me to open up to you about my, my issue you so that you can then solve them and gosh if i'm going to open up to you with those inner issues there's going to be a connection between us that is it can't be separated on price you know you're so right john i can't tell you how many salespeople and business people i've watched just like jared and my husband that at the end of this thoughtful discovery process the customer says you know you're selling homes. We've been looking at a lot of homes. We, we like yours the best. They haven't even seen anything yet. We've been looking at a lot of CRM systems. <sighs> Nimble is far away and the best. And John, what's happened is they know that you understand them. 
And I don't know how to emphasize this enough. Yeah. Yeah, it's Love fascinating. It. So um, I guess since we're talking about questions, I'd love to know, since we're at that halfway point, if there's any questions from the audience. Well, Sherry, I don't see enough questions. So I'm going to push the audience a little bit and say, start typing some questions because I think we all learn when we ask questions. Uh, and so uh, one of the questions was, will the notes be delivered? Yes. Uh, another question question is uh, pertaining to Nimble in regards to its effectiveness for managing 50 plus calls a day and doing sales development. Uh, and so the answer to that is yes, Philip, uh, contact us directly and we'll talk about that. I don't want this to be about Nimble. I want this to be about how Sherry can help you uh, grow. And um, But uh, uh, I have a question here from Lou. Would you do business with a bleeding heart on empathy or may not be competent or would you rather be business extremely competent person who, who can empathize what's the difference wow, i think i think great. you covered it but but let's let's just dig into that a little bit more for lou my sicilian cousin <laughs> yeah, sicilian cousin i uh john will you rephrase that that was such a good question i need it uh replay sure would you do business with a bleeding heart on empathy who may or may not be competent or would you rather be business with extremely competent person who can empathize? I would say the latter, but again, I want to emphasize today, business is harder to win. You need both. I mean, yeah. you know, if, if all you do is have empathy and you're a nice person, but then you can't deliver, they'll really like you and they'll invite you to a party and they'll invite you over for Thanksgiving, but you're not going to get much business. <laughs> all right? Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I, have, I, have, I have another question from Michael Elliott. He said, yeah. what's the best way to connect emotionally when you're only contacting people via the phone and email? Yeah. And I, and I want to take this and I want you to take a stab at it too. So what I do before I meet with somebody is I nimble them. And if you think about it, if, if you want to get to know John Ferrari, you, you can go check, you can Google me and then go to my LinkedIn profile, which is the typical process everybody does. And you're going to see my business persona. You'll see a picture of me looking great because somebody did a great photograph and my business background, which is, you know, whatever I did in business. But if you really want to know John Ferrara, my heart and soul, you need to connect on my five Fs of life. And I call it family, friend, food, fun, and fellowship, which are basically the human things that we all connect on. And I did that when I connected with uh, a CEO of a large software company and when i nimbled him it gave me not just his linkedin background but his background across twitter facebook linkedin pinterest instagram foursquare google plus and crunchbase and through that process i saw that he had two sons that were eagle scouts and that he was an assistant scoutmaster now i have two sons that are eagle scouts and i was a scoutmaster for six years and through that process you yeah. earn intimacy and trust by sharing something that is that close to your values and your experience in life and i had an immediate emotional connection on our shared commonalities and i think that that's where you need you need to dig deeper with people it's your job to know who somebody is and what their business is about before you ever pick up the phone what do you think sherry yeah absolutely and um you, you know when you're on the phone uh, don't forget you, you can still ask questions you can still have a commonality and you're absolutely right john you want to learn everything you can about them. And you said something golden, and it's always better to connect on values, what you believe than what you do. And try to think of that. What is it that you believe in? It's a much deeper form of connection than, do you like the Yankees? Me too. You're a vegetarian? Me too. And one of the things that I might recommend is who, what, where, when questions are genuinely, genuinely skin and bone questions. Why? questions are going to be those heart questions. So I have seen SDRs, people on the phone, um, really start to think about skin, bone, and heart questions, and it makes a huge difference. So you can do it on the phone, a little more difficult. If you can do it via um, video like Zoom or another program where you can actually see each other, it's even better. And I want to just sort of end this segment on ask with this. Asking difficult questions takes courage. It really does. Sometimes the questions are very, very hard to ask when you're um, asking to get a commitment towards the end of the sales process. That takes courage. 
But I learned from Brene Brown a couple of years ago that the root word of courage or C-O-U-R means heart. So I believe that if we have enough heart, if we care enough about our product, if we care enough about our customers, we will have the courage to ask those difficult questions. So how do we put it into action when it comes to ask, ask skin, bone and heart questions, learn the proper sequence. You wanna start with skin questions. Don't start with heart questions. Just like the 36 questions we talked about, it's too confronting for people. You wanna start with easy questions and have them get more and more meaningful. And every time you're gonna connect with a client, whether it's the second meeting, the third meeting, the fourth meeting, certainly the first meeting, I would spend a lot more time then you think you need to spend crafting the perfect questions. This is where you wanna spend your time in addition to nimbling them and learning everything that you can about them. Now, what do we do after we've asked these skin, bone and heart questions? Well, we need to listen and really listen for the response. There is so much data out there about listening. And what we know is that on a sales call, Whoever does the most talking is the one who, well, let me put it this way, that a salesperson needs to do less talking than the customer. And yet data shows again and again, this doesn't usually happen. What usually happens is salespeople get so excited to present that they talk more than the customer. Now we've all heard that we're supposed to listen, but what does that really mean? I heard a phrase once that I wanna share with you um, actually, I'm going to tell you a little story. When I was in sales, um, when I first started years ago, and this was before we had the internet, John, so we didn't have any nimble. Um, we no, would get. We had, we had gold mine. We did have gold mine, but we actually, I, this might even be 20 years ago, we weren't using gold mine. And I remember a guy, Tom Bubrick, who was the regional sales manager, came to our site in Colorado with news of the greatest salesperson in, that he had ever seen. And we all gathered around. And I remember Lisa said to him, well, what does he say, this greatest salesperson in the world? Somebody else said, well, what does he do? And Tom just looked at us and said, you know, he listens so hard, it hurts. And I never forgot that. What does that mean, to listen so hard that it hurts? And a couple of things that I might recommend that we do the number one thing we can do to listen so hard it hurts is just when you listen, think about how much you don't listen and how much you're thinking about what you want to say, what you want to chime in. The other thing is I learned this. Listen for the said, the unsaid and the unsayable. So you not only want to listen to what somebody says, but you want to listen to the unsaid or the emotion behind the words. And again, if you're on the phone, it's a little bit more difficult, but sometimes you can hear what is somebody really feeling and what might they be scared to share at all. And then probably the most important part about listening is a step in the sales process that, that I call information confirmation. And information confirmation is the act of repeating back to somebody what they just said and what you heard. And John, so many salespeople, they do a great job of building rapport. They do a great job of doing a discovery. But when you miss the step of saying, what I think I heard is, and you repeat back, because it's one thing to listen, it's another thing to prove you've listened. And when you can do this step, I call information confirmation, very often the customer will say, oh, well, Andy, you forgot that. Oh, and there's also this. And when somebody feels heard, that's how we're really showing our competency in our listening skills, but our empathy in our connecting skills. Any comments on that, John? Well, I, I really believe that people are desperate today to be seen, heard, liked, and loved. I think that you could just see it in the way that everybody walks around staring at their phones, looking for the notifications from the crap that they're they're posting on their social media accounts to for people to actually see them. And I think that you can tap into that as a business person by just listening, 
and communicating effectively with the person, being present. You know, Sherry, I really believe that we're on this planet to grow by helping other people grow. And this was sort of reemphasized to me when I was 41 years old and almost died from a tumor. And on that journey, I really saw that we're here to be present with other people. And that's it. That's all you leave is those moments. And so if you're a salesperson, you could maximize your ability to connect with others and get them to open up so you can solve their needs. And I think that this one thing you're talking about, asking for the confirmation, it, it closes the loop and it gets you closer to the point where they're going to be able to make a decision. And what I, I so love what you said about you know, getting back to connecting, you know, I, I believe that connecting is well, why we're here. And there's even some research, John, that when a baby is born, if a baby isn't touched and loved, they actually grow up weaker and their immune systems don't function correctly. I mean, we need human contact. We need to be touched. And there's also some research now that's kind of scary that the first generation of smartphone users probably nobody on the line, although perhaps, has 40% less empathy. If you think about it, we're so used to, like you said, being on our phones. If we get in an argument with somebody, how many times do we send an emoji <laughs> instead of actually confronting it? You know, when I was a little girl, if we got mad at somebody, we actually had to deal with it. We couldn't just send a, a scowly face. Um, but today, you know, we can have 5,000 friends and still be alone on a Saturday night, right? The connection isn't there. So it's a skill that we have to practice. And I think that's why this is so important because people will look at this and say, yeah, yeah, I know this. I know I'm supposed to connect. I know I'm supposed to ask. I know I'm supposed to listen, but are we doing it? Are we really doing it? And the best way to practice empathy is to be empathetic. So I don't believe that sales is something you do when you meet with a client. I believe it's who you are. And so we need to practice it with our children and our communities everywhere because it's a muscle. Empathy is a muscle. Optimism is a muscle. And the more we practice it everywhere in our life, little acts of kindness. Go When you go to the dry cleaner next, ask the person that you've seen for the last 15, 20 years, how's your day? What are you doing this weekend? And you'll be surprised what a connection you create and how good you feel. And then you take that energy into every other encounter for the rest of the day. It's really you, magic. You know, Sherry, I used to get so angry and embarrassed when my dad would talk to everybody, even at the market, yeah. just stop and talk to people. And, and I just like, really dad, it's like, shouldn't we be going and doing this thing that I really want to do? And why are you taking the time to actually connect with all these people? And I grew up and became my dad. And when I'm at the market, uh, I, I don't stare at my phone when the person's checking me out, uh, you know, checking checking out my groceries, is what I mean. Um, I, I was I, gonna say, Don, you still got yeah. a lot of people checking you out. Wow. Oh, please. So um, I connect with that person. I ask them how they're doing, what's going on. And because I think that, like I said before, we're on this planet to grow our souls by helping other people grow theirs. And th if you practice that every day, not just with the people you sell into, but everybody around yeah. you, that you get into a motion, you develop a muscle for right. caring and listening. And I think that's what you need to do to make this work. You can't just do it with prospects and customers. That's exactly right. And that information confirmation um, for the gentleman who asked about selling over the phone, this is a great way after a call to email back what you heard and next steps. Again, this is a lost art. Writing is a lost art. But I've found that when you meet with a customer, if you can send them something of value, sure. But before you even send them a great article, a great piece of content, something that inspired you, say, based on our conversation, this is what we talked about today. It is, it's about as impressive as sending a thank you note in the mail. <laughs> You know, your customers will love it. So think of that. Ask, you know, think of connect, ask the skin, bone, heart questions, listen, use that confirmation statement. And the last thing I want to talk about is linking. And what do I mean by linking? Well, again, I break salespeople into three categories, good, better, and best. And I always say that good salespeople actually do a discovery. 
they actually ask questions. Um, better salespeople ask the right questions. They ask the skin, bone, and the heart questions. But what do the best salespeople do? The best salespeople now take that precious information, the information that the client gave to you or prospective client, and they have the empathy and the competency to link it to their product or service. So this linking is of critical importance. And there's a few, way that, few ways that we link. One really simple way is just start using the phrase, earlier you were telling me that. This sounds simple, but as my mentor once said, it's simple, but if you're not doing it, it's advanced. So um, start using earlier you were telling me that, stories. I love to share with salespeople, we have a whole course on storytelling where we will just work on the art of the story because stories are proven to create emotion, which again, people buy with emotion, but stories are a great way to link. Customer gave you a problem. Here's what happened with another customer just like you. Customer gives you an objection. You know, earlier you were telling me that, let me tell you about the Joneses. Let me tell you about, uh, you know, Paul Jones over at such and such a company. And so really practicing those stories. So we're going to practice empathy. We're going to practice stories. It's a great way of linking. And um, the other one thing I wanted to say about linking, um, I've been climbing for years. Um, I've never climbed anything you know, really hard like K2 or, or anything like that. But one of the things you learn when you rock climb, when you do a little bit of mountaineering is that you want to put in your pack just enough gear that you don't weight down your pack, okay? But if you don't bring enough, you're gonna end up being exposed, you're gonna be cold, something's gonna go wrong. So that packing the backpack is of critical importance. Well, words have weight. One of the biggest mistakes salespeople make is when they link, they give the customer too much information. Pick out three features and benefits of your product and focus on the most important. Particularly today, I started out saying, people are overwhelmed. Remember this, you confuse them, you lose them. What are the three most important things to tell this particular customer that's in front of you? What are the three most important things that you learned in that discovery? And now how do you link it to your solution? John, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I really think that what you're talking about is repeating back to somebody what they've already shared with you and then connecting that to a particular thing that your products or services might meet for them. And that's linking and really closing the loop and getting them to begin to see what you're what you can provide in order to solve their needs without really selling them right you're just sort of connecting yes. these dots and, and it goes back to one of the questions uh that was asked uh by our audience and i've been collecting some of these for the end for us to cover is how many times do i need to talk with a customer before i try to sell uh how can i open the sale please give me an example that is the example right there and it's not really selling as you know so many people think i'm going to get on a go to meeting thing and i'm just going to start presenting my deck right i'm not going to take the time to ask you anything about you or your needs or do any research on your company i'm just going to get into my presentation those people get shot down in flames but if you practice this methodology that you're talking about with heart and sell i, I can't think how you can't really dramatically improve uh, the way you do business well what happens is then customers buy and we don't have to sell they really mm -hmm. do when, when you mm -hmm. connect that deeply i was telling you mm -hmm. earlier you know as i look at my customers today they're they're my friends they're we're, we're on yeah. speed dial we go through life events together and again i know it depends on what you're selling and you know if it's more, more transactional you're we might not have customers for life but um that's right when you really connect when you really care when you're adding value in every interaction that's hugely important today too again people are overwhelmed what can i do to add value to that customer today and value that's specific to their needs linking it again to their actual needs um i have one closing story i'd like to share john but should we answer a few questions first uh you bet so 
Um, one of the comments that I love from James Klein, who happens to be a, a QuickBooks and uh, accounting uh, consultant in Southern California, he said, listen also has the letters for the word silent. Ooh. I know. <laughs> Isn't that great? Wow. <laughs> Uh, maybe yeah. he should win a book, John. Okay, great. Bingo, James. Yeah, 10 books to give away, I think. Yes, we're giving away 10 books. Uh, and James, that that definitely wins uh, a book. I'm gonna, can I use, I want to know if I can use that. That's good. He's a sweetheart, yes. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that he uh, would approve that. Um, how do you build a connection when your prospect has Googled your company and seems to have made up their mind not to trust you? Ouch. Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Well, then I guess I would wonder why they've even agreed to meet with you. <laughs> you know, I, and I might ask them, you know, I just love being real with people. You know, the elephant in the room. Well, gosh, OK, sounds like you don't trust us. Well, can I do you mind if I ask why you agreed to meet with us today or why you agreed to talk to us today? But the big thing I also share with people, and this is critical, always tell your customer what your product or program won't do so they'll believe what it will do don't make it all roses and perfect a, 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 here's another one a product doesn't have to be perfect your product has to be better than the alternatives nothing's perfect in life and so what I would do is think about your product or service and write down what are two or three baby negatives that you can share about why it's not perfect and, and another point on that I often say that if your product or services isn't a good fit for somebody, tell them. They yes. will love you more and they will recommend you even though they didn't buy from you. And give them a referral. That's exactly right. You know, I have this happen in my business all the time. A customer will say, you know, do you, you know, can you do one-on-one -on -one coaching? Gosh, I, you know, I don't do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, Carol Mahoney, one of the sales pros, is a great one-on-one -on -one coach. Um, but it's not what I do. And and you do. You need to be real about what, what you do and, and what you don't do. Absolutely. And and here is a here is an ex a question. How do you use social media without sound to connect without sounding creepy? And and I think wow. I shared an example <laughs> like that with 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 the Boy Scouts, right? Where yeah. this CEO of a large software company shared a commonality that we both shared and and Sherry, I have to tell you, uh, spending six years with High Adventure, growing young men, uh, young boys into men and backpacking, you know, seven days in the wilderness with uh, other assistant scoutmasters was life changing for me. And just the other day, I was looking at these photographs of my son and I up on the peak of a, a 13,000 foot pass. And I know that if I connect, share that with somebody else who's been through that experience, it's kind of like people who landed at D-Day and marched uh, through Bastogne to Berlin, right? And so I think that that's a good example of it. But you certainly want it, wouldn't want to say, yeah, you know, I, I see that your daughter does dance. My daughter does dance too. Like maybe not right, in the, right out the gate, right? So there's certain things, there's certain places that you don't want to go where it might sound creepy, but you know, I think we all learned how to behave in kindergarten, right? We learned from our grandmother. We got smacked down when we said things that were that were inappropriate, and you just apply that same appropriateness to your flow uh, using social media. What do you think? No, absolutely. I mean, the same rules of networking that we learned years ago apply on social media, and I think um, you know that is a great question. Um, just use the same. I think just the fact that you took the time. To to look and didn't spam somebody on LinkedIn or whatever social media that you're using shows a lot. And, and you know, I have people all the time that'll say, hey, I see that you're a Colorado buff. Um, I, you know, I'd love to, you know, such and such. I think just the, the fact that you're doing it is huge. And I love what Jared did, uh, the car salesman. I thought it was classy and brilliant. He said, I like to find out a little bit more about the people that I serve for, you know, and and I think that there's many ways to do it, but the idea is, um, you know, to to do it with authenticity. You know, really care. You know, so, not don't so, forget. So there's a couple more uh, questions here. One was just a, a quick thing. What about using join me in a meeting uh, uh, to sell people over the phone? And the only comment I'd want to make on that is 
whether it's join me or go to meeting or zoom or whatever tool you use turn your camera on because yeah. i really believe that people connect through their eyes through their face it's a window to the soul and it also gives you the ability to read people and one of the things that you said earlier sherry was you really need to be able to listen and i think you listen more than with your ears i think that we have built-in sensitivities that allow us to discern signals by combining the feelings that we get of what we see, what we hear. And I think we have a sixth sense. I think that we have an ability to see things that you can't see. And I'll give you an example. You ever been walking down the road and you felt like you're being looked at and you turn around and somebody's checking you out? Um, I haven't had anybody check me out for a long time, John. But you know what I mean. And, yes. and, and, I, and I, I'll be honest, sometimes I'm walking down the street and and I see something interesting and, I, and I'm, I'm looking at it and that per person turns around and, and kind of goes, you know, you feel things. So I think you need to tap into that sort of inner feeling. And, and that part of that is if you're talking to somebody, try turning on your camera and connecting yeah. with them. And then this last question, I know we're kind of running out of time. This one, I, I kind of feel this because I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm 50. I'm 58 years old, Sherry. So I'm an old fart in some ways, right? I'm the NAC, NAPC, CP sends me invites, the National Retired uh, Association. It actually should take them up on it because you get great discounts. But I have to do business with a bunch of young people because I'm in the software business on the West Coast, right? Imagine how do I work in that environment? And the question is, um, when you're established sales exec, let's call it old and work with younger clients. What are your thoughts on getting to younger clients who look to old sales and a, just as an old person is trying to sell me something, what do you, what do they know? <laughs> I, I think what they're trying to say is how can you connect and relate to other people that are from a different age? I'm still working on that with my 13 year old. So when you figure it out, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> you know, um, seriously, the more, again, I can't emphasize this enough, A, the more interest you take in them and their world, the better people love talking about themselves, get them to talk about themselves, and B, learn their world. We have no excuse for not learning the technology, for not um, being part of what they care about. And I think it's so critical today. I go crazy when people say, oh, I don't do technology, I'm old. We've got to have a growth mindset. We've got to learn everything that's important to that generation and connect with them where they are. Well, I don't think that we would be where we are today, nimble or myself. Imagine I retired at four year, 40 years old. I spent 10 years raising three babies. Nobody knew who I was when I started nimble. Uh, and so I had to go build my brand and the nimble brand. And the way that I did that was identifying influencers in and around the core constituents of the promise of our product and build and pay forward relationships with them. So I have great relationships with a bunch of young people that I learned from actually. In fact, I was watching somebody on stage, Brian Fanzo, who's a top millennial speaker talking about Facebook advertising. And I just, I sat front row and I shouted him out on, on social. And he sent me a message back later that said he was touched by me taking the time to come and that um, that I was inspirational to him when he was making a decision to leave his company in Phoenix and go on the road and try to be a speaker, which he's done successfully. So I think if you're an older person, you, you've got a lot to give to the world. Teach and help other people grow. You will make it. And Sherry, I think we're running out of time. Take us down to the final sort of uh, slides where we, where we walk uh, people through some of the, uh, the takeaways um we are going to give you the first chapter of uh heart and cell all you got to do is go to this url uh, and you can download it um, and we will send that link in the follow-up email so everybody will get a copy of the video the copy of the slides and a cop uh, a link to this book uh and there's a quiz tell us about the quiz sherry oh the quiz is fun uh it's a 10 question quiz and you can see, do you lead more with heart and empathy or do you lead more with courage and salesmanship? And of course, the goal is to balance the two. Just a fun quiz. Uh, 
So go ahead and take it and see if you sell more like Susie or more like Tony. And then what you can do to be respectfully assertive, be more in the middle between heart and sell. And, and for those of you who haven't tried Nimble yet, please go ahead and check it out. Uh, normally, uh, it's a, uh, uh, a limited trial, but we're going to, uh, for anybody who signs up today, we're going to give you an option to win a free book. We're going to give away 10 of those. And then finally, in closing, connect with Sherry. She is amazing. She is a great person to learn from. And if you are a woman sales professional, for sure, reach out to Sherry and check out the Women Sales Pro Group. I love those women. I learned from them. And the last time I presented, I actually started tearing up and uh, got emotional because of the love and support that they showed me uh, not just that night in Boston a few months ago, but really they've been supporters of, of my passion and my purpose of building a platform to help other people grow for years. And I'm just so grateful. And then if you haven't connected with me yet, connect with me, uh, let me know how I might be able to help you grow. And thank you for everybody attending today. Thank you, Sherry, for your, you, your heartfelt you, wisdom. Thank you to the audience. And I just want to leave you with this quote. Remember that what you do matters, but who you are matters more. Amen. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Adios.